about a game. It's a red skin. Hello everyone. Today we have Yash with uh, us, and uh, again we're gonna have uh, another mock here. And uh, Yash is a software developer. Basically, he's from Java background. So let's welcome Yash and let's start the interview of him. Okay. Hello, Yash. Hi, sir. Okay. So Yash, uh, before I get started with anything, uh, just let me know your you know backgrounds, your current companies, uh, the current roles, and everything. and uh, well uh, before i uh, before you answer this question i'll just tell you that there is no need to expose your company name and everything uh, just normally just introduce yourself tell me your years of experience and just tell me the project the kind of project that you are working in right now yeah so hi all i do have a 3.9 years of experience as a full stack developer Mm-hmm. I have worked for two organization, and the current company I'm working for now is in ad tech platform. Basically, we do provide online platform where students do prepare for their examinations, exams basically. So, in my current organization, we are using a Spring Boot application, and for front end, we are using Thymleaf HTML JavaScript, and for back end, we are using Spring Boot, Spring Security, Java, Hibernate, JPA. and when it comes to a database we are using postgres sql so this is something about uh, my current organization or the languages i am currently working on perfect yeah looks like you have a very solid background yash so yeah uh, and before we get started you know uh, we're going to have a lot of discussion and as usual as i said i know you are pretty well okay and uh, i know like you know the technology that he has gone through so maybe uh, whatever the discussion that we going to have that's all about our knowledge yes right so but you know i just want to let everyone know like you know if you are getting time just you know just prepare for the same question do some research by your own just don't go by our answer or our discussion but i'll try my best to give you everything with this interview but you know uh, always is good that you know if you can go for the other platform you can browse through wave and can collect more and more information about a particular question okay cool so yes just tell me uh, from which uh, category will be starting either it is going to be hibernate spring uh, java from where you want me to get your interview started And sir, it's up to you. But uh, yeah, if I if I have to choose, I have already watched your first mock. So yeah, yeah, it's a very good point. Very good point, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so in the first mock, I have taken a mock with Akhil. That mock is available on YouTube. Whatever the questions I have asked to Akhil, I will not be asking to Yash. Okay, so I'll be. Um, I have prepared a different set of questions for Yash, and my intention here is that to cover maximum number of questions. And Yash also has done a switch recently and got placed in a very good package. If anybody wants some treat, you can just email to Yash or just connect with him on Instagram. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah. So let's start with Hibernate. and uh, okay first of all before we get started with hibernate i just want to i just want to uh, you know ask you a very simple question yes tell me the difference between uh, the jdbc and the hibernate so why we should use hibernate here so basically why we should go with the hibernate it is an orm what mm-hmm. does it really means it's a object relation mapping that mm-hmm. means the object classes we do have in our project that is known as entity it mm-hmm. only maps that to our database it is not creating another or different tables okay so it helps us to provide more object oriented concept basically and when it comes to a jdbc it is simply related to a sql concept where we are writing sql qu- queries for table only not for object okay so that's the main difference between these two uh, the other difference is like if we go with jdbc we do have to write a query that is database dependent what does it really mean suppose if we are writing any query for mysql database and in future if our manager told us to change the database from mysql to oracle or postgres sql so then what we do need to do we do need to change a whole query structure that we have written in our project 
Okay, Perfect. that's the main issue. But when it comes to a hibernate, as I told you, it's the ORM. So what hibernate do? Basically, whenever we are using hibernate, there are some configuration file in which we do define some property. So the main okay. property of hibernate is dialect. What does it do? It basically do a conversation or it simply translate our HQL query to our database that we are using. Okay, suppose if we are using MySQL right now, and uh, if we have written any HQL query, or in future, if we are going to change our database, so we don't need to change the whole query structure that we have written in our project. We can simply change the dialect according to the corresponding database, and Hibernate will take care of that. It will automatically going to translate the query to the corresponding database. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So there is another yeah. difference that just come in my mind. Whenever we are going with JDBC concept, we simply do mm -hmm. need to take care of all the exception that can occur. That means we do need to define our call inside a try and catch mostly. Okay. But when it Perfect. comes to a hibernate, it simply take care of all those checked exception and convert them into a unchecked. Yeah. So basically what you're trying to say, Yash, in uh, JDBC, we, uh, whenever we write any code in JDBC and in simple Java, we need to handle the SQL exception. And uh, SQL exception is, of course, is a checked exception. We have to handle those exceptions. But in Hibernate, Hibernate takes care of you know, converting those SQL exception to runtime exceptions, right? Perfect. Pretty good answer. Uh, pretty happy with that. Well, whenever we basically talk about Hibernate, Yash, uh, so in Hibernate, we have a couple of things like you know, session factory and session, okay? So can you just tell me the differences between session factory and session, why we should use session factory and session? Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. session factory and session. Okay. I would like to go with the, some simple example first, just consider like we do have a big store. Okay. And if we want something from that store, what we simply do, we go inside, we buy it. Okay or we simply ask the distributor to provide us that object or that thing item as well. So it is a similar like of concept. Session factory is like a big store. It has only sessions as a item that is object. Okay. And it provide that object as per our requirement. So now let's come to a programming concept. So session factory basically is a object factory as its name says factory. So it provides a session as an object which we can use to perform for our CRUD operation. CRUD operation, I hope everyone knows. Okay, so the role of object factory is only to provide a session object. Okay, now what does that, what we can do with that session object? We can simply use that session object to perform any insert operation, delete op operation or update operation. When it comes to a different scenario, just suppose if we talk about a multi-threading environment, okay, so session factory object can be used by different threads, that means multiple threads, okay. But session object, a particular object is only going to be used by a single thread, okay. So that is also a difference between both of them. If we do thing like why we are creating multiple sessions, so yeah, that is the main difference. But there is also another difference. Like if we talk about a session factory object, it is a heavyweight. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? If we are going to create multiple session factory object, it is going to slow our processor. Okay. Perfect. And uh, as we know, uh, sessions are uh, simply kind of caches. So they are lightweight. So yeah, these are the some simple basic difference between session factory and session. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to counter you right now. Uh, okay. I'm going to just turn off my AC a little bit. Uh, just give me one minute, Yash. Okay. Sure. The electricity is back, by the way. <laughs> okay. Okay. So right now I think we can have a very nice discussion because there was no electricity and it was I'm <laughs> sweating. So yeah. Now I think the things are back to normal. All right. So, okay. Yeah. So you have uh, given me the very detailed information about the session and the session factory. You said that the session factory is heavyweight and the session is lightweight, right? Okay. 
and you said that if we are creating many session factory objects our you know processor is going to take a lot of processor a lot of uh, memory basically is going to take so here is my next question can we create multiple session factory in our application yes or no yes sir okay so can i create multiple session okay so should i create multiple session factory object in my application yes or no we shouldn't I mean, it's not like we shouldn't create. Yeah, we can create if we, our company is telling us to create because there is no side effect. In, in which scenario? That, in which scenario you should create multiple session factory instance? Yeah, in means uh, we we should go for multiple session factory in, instance if we are using multiple databases. Suppose Spot for up. image upload. Yeah. That's what I want to hear. Yes. If you are using many databases, for each database, we should create only one session factory instance because it's heavyweight and it takes a lot of memory. So we should go for only one and only one session factory instance. Perfect. And you said the session is short lived, right? Okay. So if you want to compare the session, listen to this question very carefully. If you want to compare the session, uh, session is a hibernate thing, right? And if I want to compare the session stuff with the JPA, then what is the similar object we have in JPA to deal with uh, various, uh, you know, crowd uh, to, to deal with various crowd operations? We should have methods in JPA also, just like in uh, uh, in Hibernate, you have methods like you know, save, saber update, uh, you know, delete. Okay, you have different methods. A remove method you have, saber update method you have, a save method you have, update method you have, right? In Hibernate API, just like that in your JPA also, you have different, uh, you know, methods, right? And um, here you are dealing with the session. They are, what is the similar object you'll be creating in JPA and, and how will be performing those crowd operation which, over which object? Okay, so basi basically when it comes to a JPA, mm -hmm. uh, we, we do have some basic, uh, okay. But basic, uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it- It's so, entity manager. Yeah, it's, it's an entity manager. So th there is a persist, persist method Persistent. Okay, that, yeah, persistent method. Because I, I haven't used particularly JP because I have worked on only Hibernate. So I it's never fine, used... It's fine, yes. yeah. But we have we have a um, uh, you know class called Entity Manager in JPA, right? And the similar class, if you compare uh, JPA and Hibernate, we have Session. And Hibernate basically you know, exchange the feature of JPA and provides us some much more functionality uh, with much more functionality methods uh, in terms of like, you know, save, server update. If you want to say persist method in JPA does the same work as the save method in the hibernate, right? Yes. Sir. Perfect. Uh, cool. So basically, yes, what do you mean by persistence context in hibernate? Okay, persistence context is a JPA thing or a hibernate thing? You said so you are not using JPA pretty much in your company. Yeah, yeah but but yes, but it is a Hibernate thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a JPA thing, but Hibernate basically does use use the same terminology. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, tell me about the persistence context. I know if you're gonna compare the JPA persistence context and the Hibernate persistence context, they both are same because obviously Hibernate is basically extending the JPA uh, stuffs that Oracle is providing, right? Not only Hibernate, any or any um, you know ORM tool that we have, like just like Hibernate, MyBetis, and whatever, right? They all are basically uh, providing the features for us by extending the JPA, right? Perfect. Okay, tell me the Tell me uh, basically what do you mean by persistence context and why we are using it in Hibernate? So yeah, persistence context is just uh, like a block. Okay, what does it really mean? So it comes into a picture whenever we open a session. Okay, whenever we open a session, that time the block, particular block is created inside our memory and that block is oh, okay. known as a persistence context. And the What is the role of that persistence context? The role of that persistence context is to maintain or to store all the states of our objects and inside that uh, memory area, we do also have a session object that communicate with our database. So this is just a simple definition when it comes to a persistent context. Okay, perfect. So basically, have you ever heard about the caching in Hibernate? Yes, sir. Uh, means yeah, how many I, table I, of 
how many level of caching should we have in hibernate yeah, yeah basically two levels are there let's so, talk about the first level let's talk about the first level okay first level of caching imagine i have created an entity object okay and then i did save it when i did when i did save it so i should i should do session.save then i should pass on my entity object inside the save method isn't it yes then sir. do you think uh, that the object is managed by persistence context the moment you are going to the moment you are going to open a session everything is managed by your persistent context sir so imagine you are you have an entity right and uh, basically uh, you have an entity you have set some value to your entity and you are trying to save it so you are doing session.save and you are passing that entity with your save method right now the moment you're going to do you know save you say that everything will be managed by persistence context and the persistence context that means your session is going to keep track of uh, you know every data that you have put inside your entity right and the moment that you're going to do transaction.commit is going to commit those changes right to your database perfect now i want to understand one more thing let's say right now um, you know i have an entity okay and i'm keep changing the entity value Okay, I'm keep updating one of the value. Let's say I have an entity called student. I'm keep setting the student name multiple times. Let's say thousands time. Do you think thousands time my row is going to be get updated in my database, or it is going to be only updated once uh, in the last time that I have did the update? With that changes only, it will update the database. So, um, so how many times is going to hit the database if I'm going to keep modifying my entity again and again? Uh, before i do a commit so basically what will it do here I, I i i am guessing what you are trying to say whenever you fetch any record from your database and then you try to change that entity particularly mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so what what will the persistent context really do whenever mm -hmm. we fetch any record it maintains mm -hmm. a copy of that object so suppose if we do simply call session dot get and we are getting any object for particular id suppose student s1 so what will it do it will keep a copy it, it will it will make a original reference as a s1 in the persistent context and up after that suppose if we are doing any changes like we are changing its address name or whatever we are changing it won't update that s1 object it will create a new reference object okay or we can say a clone object okay and then it will perform all those change operation in that object now suppose after doing these changes hundred of time like we are we have set the name hundred of time so whenever we are going to call a transaction dot commit or even if we won't call that what will that persistent context do it will check in the memory block that is there any object that is available in the context or not but then it will found two object okay the original s1 and the s copy of s1 that we were continuously updating so what it will do it will then compare both those object if there is any difference between those object it will only hit the update query single time it won't hit it the 100 times it will hit only one time okay so yes it will update that record only single time can we say that's the first level cache yes that that is the first level cache that's the first level cache because it the all the records are managed in cache memory so this is the first level perfect. cache example perfect so that's what i want to hear that basically the persistence context is a first level cache when we say session session is the persistence context isn't it yes, session sir. is a persistence context so anything we are doing that is kept track of the session i mean any any time we are trying to modify our entity uh, those uh, you know changes are being tracked by our in, uh, by our session or our persistence context right so uh, and it it does a compare like okay well this is the role let's say this is the object that i have paste from my database and uh, this is the data that i have and now when the user is trying to do a commit do that data change if the data does not change then of course you know uh, it will not 
uh, in a do anything. If the data changed, you don't even need to update the things. It will be directly you know, commit the data to the database. Perfect. Um, cool. So can you just tell me the difference between the get method and the load method? Yes, in Hibernate. Okay, get and load are the Hibernate method or the JPA methods? So basically, get is coming from JPA, if I'm mm -hmm. not wrong. But the load one was created by Hibernate people. Okay, what is the difference between the get and the load method? Yeah, means, uh, okay. So basically, both methods are used to fetch the records from DB. And both the calling ways, same for both methods. But yes, there is some difference. Like suppose if we are going to call a get method for a, okay, let's take a simple example. Suppose we do have five record in our table. And if we are going to fetch a record for any primary key or an, any ID that is available in database. So mm -hmm. what will get method do? The moment we are going to call a get method, mm -hmm. it will it will hit the database at the same time and fetch the record. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when it comes mm -hmm. to a load method, even mm -hmm. e even the object is present in our database, what will it do? It won't hit the database at that time. Suppose if I am calling session dot load, it won't hit the database that time. When it will hit the database, the moment we are going to use that object, even if we are going to use that object for printing, only at that time, it will hit the database. So the, what is the what is the design pattern it uses? The load method. So yeah, it, it is the lazy one. It's so a lazy one. And how how does it how does it work internally? What is the design pattern it used? Okay. okay. Proxy. Proxy. Oh yeah, proxy. Okay, so you are talking about the proxy one. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm talking about that only. Yeah. Sorry, so the sorry, get yeah. method basically hit your database. The moment you're gonna need something, it's gonna do a query. It's gonna get the thing from the database, right? And yes. um, uh, you know, the load method is basically gonna do a query whenever you will be actually needing the thing, right? Let's say you are doing session dot load and you are giving the primary key of a particular entity, then it, it is not going to paste the data in that moment. Rather, it is gonna assign a proxy object, right? To yes. that reference. And the moment you're gonna do, I mean, the moment you're gonna use that reference or use that particular proxy that is available, at that time it is gonna make a call and it's gonna get the data from the database and gonna make it available for you. And it is really good whenever you need something, let's say you have a very, um, if you have a relationship between a couple of entities and it has a bunch of data, you don't want all those data to be retrieved. Maybe if you're using a proxy there, then it won't be making those data available unnecessarily. So basically, whenever you'll be needing it, it is gonna face this data. I'm gonna show you some um, in a code, Yash, and maybe I'm gonna ask you some questions and get and load, but we'll be doing that a little bit later. And I'll be asking you like, you know, how these things gonna work internally. Okay. Yes, so do you think there is any other differences with get and load with respect to the exceptions that they throw? Yeah, basically get get method won't throw any exception if the record is not there. What mm -hmm. will it do? It it will return you a null. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when mm -hmm. it comes to a load method, it mm -hmm. simply return as the object not found exception when there is no record found for that primary key. So yeah, that is also the other difference between get and load method. Perfect. Okay. First you look at this. We have a Hibernate first project. Here I'll go to my uh, demo. Okay. I'll open the first program that I have coded over here. Look at this particular program and familiarize yourself, right? I'm creating the session factory object right here. With the session factory, I'm opening a session and I'm beginning the transaction. Okay. And right here from the line number 24, look at this much code. I'm trying to get something. Okay. I'm trying to load the song. Let's say I want to load a song uh, which ID is one. Okay, so I'm writing session.get of song.class of one. Okay, and I'm loading that particular song. And then I'm logging something here called method executed. And here I'm doing song.get song name. Okay, now tell me what should be the method execution flow. First, tell me as I'm writing get method over here, 
do i have the sql query fired in this line the first question is that if this line will fire me a select query it is going to look for the song in my database and is going to load it and if that is going to happen then of course this particular line will hit a sql query a select query then this particular method executed will be printed and then i'll get my song name this is going to be the flow of execution or what is going to be the flow flow of execution can you help me with the flow of execution what i'll see in my console and by the way in my hibernate config.xml if i'll if i'll open this particular file open with generic text editor the other one is not working for me look at this i am uh, i'm just turned on the so sql to true so obviously my all the sql will be shown in my console so now tell me the flow of execution so what what you are expecting from this particular program the first line is going to hit the database or not yes yeah. it will hit because we are using the get method to fetch the records okay this will be a proxy object or this will not be a proxy object this won't be a proxy object okay first you will see on your console the select query after uh -huh. that you will see method executed and uh -huh. after that you will get the name of song okay let me try that to right click run as java application okay pretty good first i am getting my select query my uh, my it's, it is facing my song then i am getting method executed then it is getting me the song name which is believer perfect now if i'm going to change it to 100 or 1000 and let me tell you that in my database i don't have any 1000 record available right over here in the table so what do you think what kind of exception you are expect, expecting right here in this case in the line number 29 so you basically if there is no record the, uh, the get method will return us null okay and uh, the moment we are trying to fetch the record from a null object, it will throw some exception. <laughs> Which exception? This is null, right? You are saying? Null. Yeah, it will be null. Uh, oh. Then null, null dot null something. Point. Null pointer. Null pointer. Yeah. Then do a right click. Run as Java application. Okay. We'll get the null pointer over here. We are getting the null pointer exception. Of course, it is trying to hit the uh, record. But whenever it is trying to hit the database, if I'm going to put a breakpoint here in the line number 27, do a right click, debug as Java application. You will see in the line number 27, we will have null as you have said earlier. Let me just debug it for everybody. Okay, so right here, whenever I'll do step over, you will see the SQL statement is fired. Okay, and here in the song, we don't have any song object over here assigned to the song. Now, whenever I'll do step over here, I'll do null dot something and it is going to hit me null pointer exception. If I'll do resume, I'll get null pointer exception for sure. Okay, null pointer. Perfect. Now let's switch to the next next thing, Yash. I want to change it to, um, let's say load. Now tell me the behavior. Here, first tell me, I should see my SQL query or not in the line number 27? No, sir. Okay. Then what will be the flow of execution? What should I see in my console? In which order? So the flow flow will be like first, first, yeah. First, let's go with this one. Number one, this record okay. exists in my database. Tell first me what will happen. So the flow will be like uh, you will see the method executed first, and uh -huh. the moment you are trying to get the song name from song object, uh -huh. at that time you will see your Hibernate will hit the query to database, and then you will see the select query. Uh -huh. And after that, you will see the line number 29. The I mean the result of line number 29. That is the song name. All right. Okay. So let me run this. Let me save everything and run this. And as you have said, can I run this? Control S. Right click. Let me run. Okay. Which one I'm running? Right click. Run as Java application. Okay. The method executed is first because this line will not hit the database, right? And which kind of object this will have, uh, Yash? This, will be, if this will be a proxy object. This will be a proxy object. So method executed will be printed first. And then this line, whenever we will be writing song.get song name, 
this is going to actually hit the database and going to get the data back right now here it is getting me the believer data back right so uh, to make it practical do a debug as java application and if i'll go to line number 27 here i have a breakpoint i don't want to switch or let me switch okay you'll see right now whenever i'll hit this there will not be any database um you know query uh, triggered here by hibernate but the song object is basically a proxy object is song uh, um, you know some dollar and some hibernate proxy it is giving me and if you can open this you can see this is basically a proxy right so when did i when basically i'll hit the proxy it is going to call the uh, you know uh, the database or database the uh, query it is going to make so maybe i'll just resume it and again i'll do that again i'll try debugging right click debug as java application so line number 27 it will not do anything it will it will basically not hit the database so the next time if i'll do step over it will be method executed and as you have said if i'll do step over one more time it is going to hit the database and get me the it is hitting the database and getting me the data okay only one question left yours you also have answered that in your interview if i'm going to change it back to uh, 100 then what kind of exception will have exception will be object not found exception perfect do a right click run as java application and we'll have a object not found exception i believe object not found exception no row with the given identifier exist and this is the identifier of the song class perfect good job Okay, cool. So can you just tell me, Yash, what is a transient state uh, in Hibernate when we say an entity is in transient state? Yeah, okay. So as, as I previously to mentioned that there are some state in persistent context. So mm -hmm. this state is one of them. Mm -hmm. What the, this state really means? So transient state is the state whenever our object is mapped to the session. So whenever mm -hmm. any object is mapped mm -hmm. to a session object, particularly that object state is known as a transient state. Okay. Do you think, okay, listen to me, listen to this question very carefully. Do you think whenever an object is managed by a session, that's called a transient state? Whenever... Let's say let's say I'm creating an entity object. Let's say I have a uh, entity called student. I'm creating a student object. Student s equal to new student. Do you think the s the reference s is in transient state or it is in persistent? No, no, state? no. It it is not in a transient state. It is in a persistent state. Why? As I told you, all hold the... on, hold on. Is it is in persistent state? You are saying yes, sir. The whenever we are creating a simple object like student as equal to new student inside the open session block so no that, i'm not opening any session i'm not opening any oh, session okay you are you are you are okay, I simply thought creating that, an object. no 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 that 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 is not attached to any state of position context that is a simple what is that can i say yeah. that transient no 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 we, we can't say that because trans then what is that state that's the transient state yes that's the transient state let's say okay hold on let me give you an example i am simply creating an entity object the entity object is not mapped to any session then that state is called transient state i'm just simply let's say i have a class called yash i'm creating the yash class object there you go that's in transient state that means it is not managed by my session or that is not getting managed by the persistence context all right the moment i'm going to do session dot save of that class object. Let's say I have a student entity. I've created a student class of the student s equal to new student, right? And I'm going to do session.save up student, right? And the moment I'm going to do session.save and I'm passing the student entity reference here inside the session uh, save method, then the session is going to maintain that particular student object. And as you have you know, explained me previously, 
the session is going to manage the student object and it's going to keep track of all the things. And then that student object goes into the persistent state because it is getting managed by the persistence context or by your session uh, in simple word in Hibernate, right? So an object, a plain object, which is not uh, which is not maintained by the session or the persistence context is called a transient state, okay? At that time, we can say that object is in transient state. The moment we're gonna put that object inside the session, that's gonna be your persistent state. And one more very good thing that I want to say here that you know when the object that you have, if it is not getting managed by your persistence context, right? Then that object doesn't have is that object is not mapped to your database, isn't it? Imagine I have just created an object, student as security new student, and I have set the property. That means that object is not mapped. That object is not mapped to your database. Whenever you actually do a save, it goes to the database, right? So the moment you're gonna have an empty, I mean, just created a student object by your own that does not have an identifier or a primary key. And if you don't have a primary key, then the, I mean, the database doesn't know about that particular record because the persistence context doesn't know about it. Like, you know, uh, that object is present inside the database or not, right? So whenever the object is in persistent state, you will always have an identifier you will always have a primary key, isn't it? Because the persistence context know that this object is right now represents to this row of my database, right? Or this row of my table. But if the object is in transient state, uh, you never know. Let's say maybe I, I will have an identifier, I will set the identifier in my wish, let's say 300, 400, 500, or I will not give any identifier. Most of the time creating the primary key or the identifier is the responsible of the database. By the auto generation by by that auto generation stuff because we can just uh, let the let the database decide what is going to be the primary what is going to be the primary key of a particular entity right so yeah that's the thing so identifier oh, if the object doesn't have an identifier it is in the transient state if it is in the persistent we have an identifier there cool uh, so what is uh, the detached state to us a detached state uh, what, yeah. what what does it mean so detached state is the one whenever our object passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever our object is released by a session object. Perfect. So yeah, that state is known as. So detached. when does that detached state happens? I mean, how can I say the object is in detached state? And I mean, after what? I mean, what should I do to make yeah. my object in detached? Yes, yes. So we 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 do need to close a session. Once we close the session object, that state of object is known as a detached state. Okay. If I don't want to, if I don't want to close the session, I will be confused. I'll be start confusing you by now, Yash, because yes, now I think you are comfortable. I am comfortable, even though there is no electricity, even though I'm sweating, still I'm comfortable <laughs> right now <laughs> because you know I'm equated with this environment right now. But anyhow, uh, just tell me, without closing the session, without closing the session, if I want my my entity to get detached from the persistence context or from the session, which is basically managing then how can I make my object detached from the session? What should I do if I don't want to close, if I don't want to close my session or if I don't want to commit the transaction? If it, if it, without that, can I make my entity to come to a detached state from a persistent state? Are you getting my question? Yeah, I, I'm getting means it's just uh, not sure if I am getting it right or not. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I hope you are, what you are trying to say, if you are not going to manually manage these closed session. Yes, I yeah. uh, no, no. I want to manually, I want to manually uh, do what? I want to manually detach a entity object from the persistent state. I, I see, you said we have a transient state. Then we have a persistent, persistent. state. Now imagine the entity is in persistent state. Okay, I want that entity to get detached. I don't want my session to manage that entity. Getting it, Yash? Yes, sir. And yes, you sir. said, okay, close the session. Close the session. The entity will be detached for sure. Yeah, I, I know I have told you guys that one. Now is the, because you guys asked me a lot of question on my sessions, right? So this is yeah. my turn. <laughs> <laughs> so without closing the session, if I want to detach an entity from the session, from the persistence context, yeah. I okay. think I'm asking the correct question. There is a method called evict or evict. Do you know, Yash? I think you should be aware about that. 
E-V-I-C-T, or I'm not sure that method. Evict method, evict. I don't know how do you pronounce that. No. Do a exactly. session dot evict. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, session dot evict. I think. Do that. Okay. That and pass <laughs> no. in that object. <laughs> actually, actually, I haven't used that method, frankly. That's fine. That's But fine. yeah, maybe <laughs> now this, this I have to go through the my. <laughs> yeah, no issue. No issue. I mean, I am also learning. No, if okay. people are going to learn from this, I am also learning within this mock. No, no. See, I'm just taking revenge from you guys, right? Right now, <laughs> everyone I'll be inviting. The moment I mean, you guys basically bombard me with questions, right? Okay, tell me this, tell me that. Okay, this is my turn. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So cool. Uh, yes, you know. Mm, okay, I will ask you another simple question. Anyhow, we will be. I'll be asking you these things with code. then it will be more easy because it will be uh, i mean you will be visualize that better but still you know uh, without showing you the code i want to ask you a few question then i'll be asking the same question with the code well imagine yash i have a transient object okay i want to move that transient object to the persistent state then yes, what is the method i can use so oh, me- means uh, any save update method will do that thing for us perfect save or server update okay yeah okay what are the other methods which are available okay uh, so that i can say my entity is in persistent state let's yeah. say i'm retrieving an entity by using the get method or load method yes sir the moment i do session dot load or session dot get and i'm going to pass in my primary key of a particular entity i'm going to get the entity back so the entity that i'm going to get back do you think that entity is in persistent state yes sir because that entity will be managed by your persistence context right yes sir perfect cool okay look at this application 1 app 1 look at this same program i have coded i have the session factory created over here i'm finding the session right over here in the line number 18 i'm beginning the transaction of the session and here i'm trying to save a song object here okay so i have couple of question in the line number 22 this object is in which state uh, i mean the song object is in which state line number 26 the song object in, is in which state and in line number 30 this object is in which state the song object is in which state yeah can you so, just tell me line number 22 yeah. Here, yeah, it, it's in transient state. It's in transient because, state because the instance is not yet mapped to, to the session. Perfect. And in the line number twenty-six. So in line number twenty-six, we are mapping our song instance to the session object. Uh-huh. So its state changes from transient to persistent. It is in persistent state, and uh, the the other one here. Once we so, once I close the session, then the session so, object will be destroyed, right? Yeah. Then this so one. The, so the moment the session object will be closed it state again change from persistent to uh just just detached. Wait, 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 detached state yeah this this will no longer at transient state because this object was previously managed by the session and once you're going to close the session this particular object state will be changed to detached state right yeah that's the question that i wanted to ask you now this leads me to the next question okay so do we save let me go to the app 2 now look at this and answer me the question Here I am creating a song object. Yash, see I have a, a song, uh, you know the song name and the, you know, singer name. Now here I am creating the session factory. I am opening the session over here, and look at this session dot contains. Do you do you know what what do you mean by the contains method? Like you know what is the work of the contains method? Yeah, Yash? yeah. Basically, basically it checks the is is if there is any instance available. of song inside the session or in the persistence context yeah so do you think the line number 27 is going to return me true or false or and, and why look at this so yeah basically it is going to return true okay just wait session dot contains no it it is going to return false because okay. we haven't mapped uh-huh. our we haven't mapped our song instance to the session yet okay so this is going to be false because you are saying that this is just a object and it is in transient state right yes 
and here we are just opening the session but till now this uh, this object is not maintained by the session because we have not used any persist method or any persistence method so far right but look at this i'm saving the song object right now so as i mean the uh, that have given me right now the song object is managed by the session now look at this so what this particular line is going to return me true or false this time you will get true true okay because it is right now managed by the session of the persistence context the song object we right click run as java application just look at that first i'm getting false and then when i do a save when i do a save over here obviously the song object is managed by the persistence context and then i whenever i'm trying to again find that whether that object is available on the session or not it is giving me true can i do the same thing one more time over here if i do control c control v then what will happen now i have changed, i have closed the session and i'm doing session dot contains up song so again do, again you, you will get the false i'm getting false or i'll be having any exception because i have closed the session over here confusing you oh answer <laughs> okay let me run this okay we got a exception the illegal state exception the entity manager or session is closed right because i have closed it over here okay if i'm going to move it to here do a control x and command v over here then what will happen this time it will be true it will be true run as java application true okay perfect good job so okay these are very nice questions is in it okay so um okay tell me yash what do you mean by connection pooling you can uh, right now you can mix up a spring a little with your hibernate answers i don't have any problem if i'm mix, mixing up you know spring what is connection pooling okay how do you create connection pooling tell me everything you know about it and then i'll be keep adding some more information to that and anyhow the electricity is again gone but right now as i said i'm comfortable <laughs> again it is a concept of kind of managing our session object instead of creating every time we do need to iter query new session it helps us to use the old object okay so old which object yeah old session object basically the in, inside the pool we do have a we we can create some sessions are you referring the connections as sessions yes sir but in yeah, yeah i am correct only correct you know with uh, if you have a connection object then only from that connection you will be get a session object right so basically you are saying it's a pool of connection the connection pooling is a pool of connections yes. now tell me why do you want me to have a connection pool if i can directly hit my database and can create a connection well, why do you think that it is important to maintain a connection pool yeah so okay so suppose if we won't go with the connection pooling concept what we will do i mean normal scenario we simply create a multiple session object to perform any operation but suppose if we have hit a particular query that is taking too much time to be execute okay so we are, we are creating multiple session object for each threads that means we don't need to create multiple session object we can simply use the session object that is created one time we can simply use that again and again whenever we want to use the that is the main concept of going with the pooling thing perfect answer so basically you are talking about the reusability yes sir that the exact word so basically what happens is whenever we directly hit our database and create a connection and the moment we going to query the database and get the data back from the database the connection is closed right but the moment we're going to connect to the database we need a lot of information like the id the url the password and the authentication the authorization will happen in the database and then it will allow us to query the data and creating connections is obviously you know what we call that uh, you know uh, it's the heavy resource right it's basically heavy lifting job and it, this is basically costly operations so we don't have to do that again and again because each time you are querying data you don't want a new connection to get created rather what we can do we can maintain a connection pool 
So we, in, in which side we will maintain the connection pool in the database side or inside the server or in the server side? Server side, not in the database side. So, so yeah. all the connection pooling is managed in whatever server like we are using, suppose Tomcat or Glassfish or there are some other yeah, servers or something, whatever. Yeah. So always in the server side only, the connection pooling will be managed yeah. in the server side only. We never create connection pool in the database side. So, in yeah. the, so whenever our server is going to be boot off, at that time, our server is going to talk to our database and create a bunch of connection for us. And we'll store those connections inside our server so that we can use those connections for connectivity with our database. Isn't it? Yes. So sir. every every time a new request come, so if, you, if, if, if that request needs some database, uh, you know, some database operation it need to do, if it need to save something or delete something, if a user want to do that, then a specific connection object will be assigned to that particular user. Then once that connection, um, is getting used by that particular user. Once that user sign off or once that uh, operation is done, that connection will go back to the pool again and will be again reused by another user is connect, who is basically connecting to our database. So connections will be there. So instead of directly creating a connection with our every request or every hit to our database, we're managing a pool and in our server end. So basically, uh, Yash, uh, to implement connection pool, okay. So what are the what are the different vendors that we have in Spring? Let's say, how yeah. do you implement connection pooling in server side? Yeah. So we uh, uh, we do have some vendors like uh, DBCP. Perfect. Okay. DBCP. DBCP is provided by whom? So it was, it is provided by the Tomcat people. Apache. If I'm not, Apache, yeah, Apache. Tomcat Apache. also has connection pooling. <laughs> Tomcat also has connection pooling vendor. Yeah, Perfect. Another okay. popular one is there. Another couple. C, 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 C3PO is also there. C3PO Hikari is one is, on. Hikari one is also. Hikari is that, one. that is the Hikari default. Is yeah, that yeah. is the default one used by Hibernate. Hikari is the default one used by Hibernate? Or def def uh, means uh, internal implementation. I, if I'm not wrong, means I. Hikari is the default one used by Spring Boot. Yeah, Spring Boot. Okay. So Spring, Spring Boot, Boot basically, yeah. whenever we use the starter data JP in our POM file, Spring Boot internally creates a connection pool for us. And that connection pool, the vendor that Spring Boot uses is Hikari connection pool. Even though if someone will go and uh, add the starter data JP into our Spring framework uh, POM file, and the moment you're gonna see the map and dependency, you're gonna see Hikari connection pool will be there by default. And you don't have to maintain any connection pooling or you don't have to add any connection pooling uh, you know, dependency into a POM file uh, 
internally Springboard is, Springboard is using Hikari. But as you said, we have a couple more vendors like DBCP. Using that, you can create connection pool. You have C3PO. Uh, basically, all this C3PO, DBCP, Yash, if you're going to create a connection pool, basically, who manages the connection pool for us? What, what is that interface or what is that class which internally manages the connection pool or a particular connection for us? Who is that guy? So data source is the one. Exactly. This is basically, what I want to hear. Data source. Yeah. Data source is basically maintains the connection pool for you. Okay. The, uh, the default data source that comes with our, uh, with our normal JDBC called driver manager. Driver. Yes, sir. Or the Spring also provides us, provides us a def, uh, uh, I mean the default class called driver manager data source, right? So do you think the driver manager data source or the data uh, the simple driver manager interface which is available on high, on JDBC, those uh, classes provides us the connection pulling feature or those classes are not providing us any connection pulling feature? Okay, again it's uh, something I never. They do not uh, provide us. Yeah, they because I have us. only used data source, so I, yeah, because I haven't used them. But yeah, more, we we are using data source concept. You haven't them. used them. Means means on a practical level, mostly I have used data source, so that is the only thing right now in my mind. But we have done connection pulling stuff so many times in our <laughs> sessions. Yes. You yeah, we have, we have we that. have tried with driver manager data source, but at that time it was not. Yeah, possible. driver manager data source is the one that we use because that comes by default with Spring. Yes. And that because if you go to that, I mean the documentation, Spring they are saying do not use this for your production. It does not provide any connection pulling. This will work the same way as your normal driver manager, and it will not give you any, you know, um, connection pooling support. So every time someone is going to query for something, it is going to hit the database and going to create a connection. But for, if you, if, as you said, if you're going to go for Hikari, C3PO, or something else, at that time we don't need to create uh, the driver manager data source instance or driver manage, uh, sorry, uh, driver manager instance. We can use combo pool data source if you are using C3PO. Yes. If you are using uh, DBCP, you can use basic data source. For Hikari also, we have some data source implementation class in Hikari uh, vendor for, for the Hikari vendor, Hikari vendor as well. So they are providing us the data source, which has the connection pooling support. But the normal Spring or driver manager data source does not have the connection pooling support. So what are the different test type that we have in Hibernate, yes. Mm, yeah. Okay. So we we do have two types of fetch concept in Hibernate. Mm -hmm. So the the first one is like lazy one, and mm -hmm. the second one is eager. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does it really mean? So the lazy one is uh, like suppose. Okay. Suppose if we do have a entity, and uh, it does have any another entity that is particularly mapped. That means it has a relationship with the undifferent entity. So what will it do? The moment we are going to fetch record for our main entity, when I'm talking about the lazy one concept only. So mm -hmm. if we are going to fetch a record for our main entity that has a relationship with some different entity, at that time, it won't fetch the record for that B entity. What does it really mean? Suppose if we are going to get the data for a table or a entity. And if we have enabled our pro one of the property of Hibernate that will show us the SQL query that is hitting on the database. So what we will notice, it will only trying to fetch the record from a table only. It won't try to fetch the record from B table, but in reality, it is already mapped to a, a table. So it should fetch, but the default concept of uh, fetching a record or this fetch type property, Hibernate people have done like uh, whenever there is a relationship like one to many or uh, many to many. So at that moment, they have provided a default fetch type as a lazy one because they sometimes we don't need to fetch the records of all the dependent entity. We simply need the single record. And uh, when it comes to a eager type, that means simply fetch the record for all the dependent entity at a single time. Okay, there is uh, another good example like uh, we talked about the 
load one. So whenever we call the load method, load method basically go with the lazy concept. Okay, because whenever we are trying to fetch a record, it won't hit the database. It get us the record whenever we are simply going to perform any operation on that proxy object. Perfect. Okay, this is the example or difference between lazy and eager concept. Okay, so do you think the lazy one we should use or the uh, the eager one we should use? And in which scenario you will go for the lazy one? In which scenario you'll go for the eager one? So mostly, mostly we should go with the lazy one because some, most of the time we don't need the dependent entities result. Okay, it totally depends on the time that we need it. Okay, suppose if we want to display some we want to perform some particular operation and our different different entity has that result or managing that input so we should go with the eager one because we do need to fetch the record at the same time but if we won't need to perform operation on all the tables or we don't require all the result we should simply go with the lazy one it simply depends on the situation perfect bang on should i hurry right now or i mean when should we discuss the salary? I'm I'm holding an offer, so if you do have any counter offer, we can discuss. <laughs> okay, you're applying the same trick on me, huh? <laughs> yeah, I have learned from you, na. <laughs> okay, very good. Yes. Okay. Whenever I'll have a freelance project, surely I'll offer you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So right now, let's talk about eager and uh, lazy face type. Yash has done a program, and he'll just give us a quick walkthrough how that eager and uh, lazy face type works and what is the use of eager and lazy face type? Yeah, yes, please go ahead. So please explain me a little bit, like, you know, how many entities you have and how- Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, I have one main file. Mm -hmm. Here it is. And I have two entities. One mm -hmm. is college and the other one is student. So okay. what I am doing, call, college can have many students. So that's why I am on line number 21. I am using one to many annotation for students object because one okay. college can so have many students. Mean? So okay, it, one, it, college. one college can have many students. So other table is student one. So many students can belong to a one college. So that's why I am mapping one many to one annotation here. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I am using at the rate join column annotation to map the uh, college ID to this student table. Perfect. So you have, okay, let, let me summarize. In the student table, uh, in the student entity, we have college dependence in line number 22. Okay, many students can belong to one college, right? And yes, can you go to the college side? Okay, you have a college entity and one college can have many students. So that's why in the line number 21, can you highlight that? You have written many to one. Right. Okay. okay. Now tell me, now tell me if you talk about college and student relationship right over here, you have a couple of entities. Now college entity has the student entity over here. So what kind of page type you will be using generally and why? So basically whenever I mean, here we are using the eager one because we are going with the one too many, but sometimes we only want the college details. So we don't want to fetch the student record because one college can have many lack student. Okay. okay. So what will happen? It is going to take some time to fetch those student result also. So here it is not a good scenario to go with the default fetch type, which is eager one. Okay. So basically you are saying that one too many has eager face type. By default, it is eager, right? One too many annotation has eager face type, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you are facing all the students, uh, I mean, uh, if I want to face all the college, then as the student has the relationship with the college, so all the students also will be by default faced. Let's say I have, I want to face all the college records of a particular district or of a particular country. Then along with those college, all the students who belong to that colleges, those data also will be faced. And of course, it will be a very heavy lifting job. Can you show me, can you prove this particular point? As you said, one too many is by default is having eager type. So can you show me your database, how many colleges you have and how many students are mapped to yeah. those colleges? Yeah, so I have already inserted some data. Uh -huh. So if we move to a college table, I have three different college, IGNU, HRM and DU. All right. Okay. 
and the id is 1 2 3 so if we move to that student table you will see i have nine students basically and uh, each student is mapped to a some different college like uh, the first three are mapped to the college id 1 that is ignu the next three are mapped to the college id 2 that is hrm and the last three were mapped to du so here we are mapping college id 3 okay so right now can you go back to your entity yash the college entity okay so right now if i will be by default if i'll retrieve my college entity so, so uh, all the college entity if i'll be retrieving or one college entity if i'll be retrieving then it will be by default will page all the students according to you in line number 21 because you have mapped that entity with at one to many and one to many default page type is ego right Yes. Can you put a breakpoint in your app dot Java and can prove that to me? Okay. Can you oh. can you can you log that C one in the line number twenty seven? Okay. Put a breakpoint in line number twenty-six. Okay. Can you start your program in debug? All right. Can you can you do a step over? I just want to see whether. that will that will hit the query i think that will hit the query but is it going to page my student data with that college can you do a step over so let's look at the query it is finding the college detail so is it finding the student detail as well no can you can you hover on c1 so are we having the student yes we are having the student uh, over here as well now you can see when did you when you basically click on that look at your console right now <laughs> it is also calling your student one because you did hit that particular you know uh, um, object right can you resume it and can start it one more time can you resume that and start this one more time okay and we want to run okay. in a debug mode yes and are you having are you having uh, the two string method inside the calls yes sir in both can table you, yeah can you go to the calls and comment out the two string method in both of the table because here you are accessing the object also the student object can you also comment the same in the student table as well all right go back to app dot java debug it one more time start it in debug mode please debug as java application all right now can i go to like can you do a step over okay the get method will be called can you do uh, can you do a another step over yes so this time it won't fetch the record okay can you hover on the c1 okay can you uh, can you see can you look inside the student i think the moment you going to hit the student see it is firing the call because yes. that's that's using a proxy okay and that that is basically fetching the student right now only isn't yeah, it but this this way is the lazy one Yes. Yes. Can you do resume? Okay. So, can you tell me right now it is using ego type or lazy type? Okay. Yeah, this one is the lazy type. This one is the lazy type, right? So, lazily it is instantiating. Okay. Can you make it ego and check what is happening? So, basically, can you tell me in the C one whenever you are printing the student object? Ah, uh, so there also you are having the child object as well, right? 
yes sir but i am not i am not using the child object i'm not i'm not i'm not basically using the student object isn't it but how it is coming in line number 27 Uh, and line number twenty seven. Basically, we we are not using student object, but we were trying to do a debug. And in debug mode, we have hit that. Uh, okay. Can uh, you can you okay. um okay? Can you just run this normally? Only one query is getting yes. fired, right? That's what yes. he was trying to say. Can yes. you make it? Can you can you make uh, that uh, face type to one to many is a lazy one, and uh -huh. the many to one is eager one. Can you make it eager? Okay. Can you run this example right now? Let's see how many queries are getting fired. It is hitting two query, na? No? See, in the end, yes, correct. Because by default, in one shot only, it is trying to face all the data, isn't it? Yes, sir. Perfect. Uh, so here it is basically in one go only. It is hitting your database and it is facing all the all the data whenever it is eager type, and by default it is lazy type. And whenever it is lazy, it is only facing the college data, but it is not bringing in the student data which are available. Right, so that's the difference between eager and lazy. So basically, you know, uh, maybe if you guys are working, I mean, you guys are already working, you should have known that in a lot of places we should have master detail view. Okay, so whenever we are loading the master, but we are not loading the detail. For an example, there is a food cart application, and you are just seeing the menu of a food, but you you don't want to see the detail of the food. Like you know, let's say you only want to see the menu, but uh, whenever you are only inquiring the menu, just show the menu. Don't give him the details. But whenever someone wants to see the details, he can click on the view details button, and then there is there will be another query will hit the database and will face the detail about that particular menu. If that is not needed, there is no need to get the details of a particular menu. Just show him the menu items, right? So basically, in master detail view, uh, always uh, always get the master data in one shot. Don't get the master and detail data together. Okay, for performance reason. But if it is, if if your application is allowing that, go with eager. But most of the time, lazy is recommended. Right? Perfect. Thank you, Yas. So let me ask you the next question. What What do you mean by generated value in Hibernate, Yas? Okay. So this this is also a designing concept used by Hibernate people. so generated value is something related to our primary key concept mm -hmm. because as we know hibernate internally uses a identifier which is known as a primary key to manage all the entity so generated values are the concept that is managed by hibernate to manage that primary key so basically it has maybe four or five way of managing these values like the auto one the identity one the sequence one and uh, i guess there is also a table one table. okay okay hold yeah. on hold on auto versus identity what is the difference what is the identity uh, when you, when you define generated value as identity and when you define generated value as auto then what is the basic difference with that yeah so basically when we go with the auto concept okay when we are defining generation type as a auto what does it really do it go with the default implementation or default method that is defined by hibernate people to generate a primary key okay so that means it won't depend on our database to generate a primary key it will generate by itself okay the default implementation used by hibernate people for auto internally is the sequence one if we go with the documentation so internally they are going with the sequence one for the auto one but the the auto means you are saying if i if i if i end it in layman term yes the yeah. auto means the identity or the entity primary key that will be saving 
let's say we are creating an entity and we're saving that entity to our database, then the primary key generation will be taken care by the framework itself, by the Hibernate framework yes, itself. Yes, sir. That's yes, what sir. you mean to say in, in yes, one sir. line. Okay. Yes, what about the identity? So the identity one is the concept that is totally based on our database. Hibernate will first try to understand which type of database we are using. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once mm -hmm. it figured it out, then it will generate the primary key on the basis of that. Like if we, uh, like we know our uh, MySQL uses a identity concept. That means each table is going to have a different primary key. Okay, that is a default implementation of MySQL. Okay, so when it comes to identity, Hibernate will, will simply check which database we are using and then it will figure out the default implementation of that generated type and then it will use that. Okay, but uh, not sure the bug is still there in Hibernate or not, but uh, the last time I have checked, there is a, still a bug in Hibernate for when it comes to a auto concept. Even if we go with the auto concept, it is calling the sequence one. But in reality, in their documentation, they have mentioned the auto one is the same thing the identity one is doing. It automatically check which database we are using and then it generate. But uh, there is a bug that why it is internally going Perfect. with the sequence one. Perfect. Okay, here I'll be asking you two questions. Okay. So if I'll keep all this uh, conversation in simple warriors, two things, identity means it will check, have I defined the, uh, um, I mean, I'm basically giving the primary key generation capacity to my database. My database should generate the key for me and that key will be used by Hibernate framework or by my entity, all right? If I am not defining the generated value as identity, if I'll be defining as, uh, you know, auto that means my database will not generate any identity key or a primary key for my entity rather the framework will attach the identity key with my entity and then the entity will be saved to my database because every time we'll be saving and data I, I mean id i mean every time we're saving a record to the database will be obviously need an id or a primary key attached with the record that's how i have it worked Yes. Perfect. And you told about sequence, right? Yes, the auto basically uses sequence behind the scene. I don't want to go in depth of that right now, Yash. But if you talk about MySQL, I think MySQL you know, doesn't support sequence, isn't it? We sequence means what? You know, we can store some records in our database, just like uh, my primary key first should be two. Let's say after yes. after two. I want four to come, then six to come, then eight to come, then 10 to come. Then I'm increasing my primary key by two uh, each time, right? I'm going with a sequence, right? I think MySQL does not support that, but Oracle support that. Yes. And SQL server support that. There we can define sequences in those databases. And I think to define those sequences in Hibernate, we can use sequence uh, generated value as well. Okay. We also have one called table. Do you know about it? Yes, sir. So, mm -hmm. tap, tap, the when it comes to a table concept, basically to generate a primary key, they are maintaining a single table, which mm -hmm. internally also use the sequence concept. Okay, but there is only a single table that is managing primary key for each entities we do have in our database. Suppose if we have a student table or a teacher table, if we are inserting a element. Uh, first in first row at that time it will generate the primary key one for that student okay and then they it will automatically going to create a sequence table okay that will manage that primary key when next time we are going to insert a record for teacher table even if there is no record in that table what will it do it will simply check that is there any we means as we have defined the generated type as a table so it will hit that table first and trying to get what is going to be the next primary key because one is already inserted so there will be the, it will found two okay. so at that moment it will provide two as a primary key for teacher table the next one app three let me go to here let me close out the app two and here Basically, I'll, I, I will ask you a very simple question, Yash. Okay, because you have already answered me this question. 
and I just want to do a little bit of practical, right? You have told me about the generated value. You have explained me about it, right? And here in my entity, I have an entity called song. So here right now, the generation, the generated type, I have given identity. As you have told me, this is going to be um, uh, dependent on my database. In my MySQL database, the table that I have for this song, if I'll go into the uh, setting of this, the auto incremented or the auto incrementation, I have checked it over here. Now my database will take the responsibility of uh, incrementing the auto generation key or auto generated key of my song. The primary key will be assigned by my database. Now my question here is, if I'm gonna go to my app app three, and if I will be put a breakpoint here in line number twenty seven, okay, and also I want okay, let me put a breakpoint here in the line number twenty seven. I'll do right click run as Java application. So, so, okay, okay, sorry. Why did I run this? I want to debug it. Debug as Java application. Look at this in line number 27. Okay, I don't want to switch. I'll do no. Uh, as of now, Yash, the data is data is saved in the database or not? We have not saved the data. Uh, now not, this sound object, yet. yeah. Now this will have the identifier or will not have the identifier if I hover on this? Not yet. Okay. I have the song ID will be zero. Can you explain this line? What will happen right now? So yeah, whenever... basically, but, uh, whenever we are going to execute at line line number twenty seven, what will happen? The song object will be mapped to our session object. The moment it is going to map to our session object, mm -hmm. it is going to execute a insert query. Okay, uh -huh. but that uh -huh. query will be only available for our cache. That means it right. won't be committed. It will be insert the data into the cache memory. So okay. what will happen the moment it is going to insert that record inside a cache memory, it will fetch the primary key or it will assign a primary key to the song instance. So the mm -hmm. moment you are going to execute line 27, do you will see that the ID is assigned. Okay, let me do a step over. Okay, so right now if I'll hover over here, I have a song ID is assigned over here. Right now this is given by my database. And right now that uh, database ID is mapped to the song ID. Perfect. Now you just tell me by this time, the uh, song class object is inserted to my database or not inserted to my database? Not, not yet. The line number, the ID 15. Okay. So should I have ID 15 because I have already ran the same method over here? No, no, we won't no. have. It, it is, it is, it will be available in the cache. Okay, inside the persistence context only till line 14 uh, till till uh, song ID 14 is available. So when it will be go into the uh, memory exactly to the exactly the moment you are going Once to I... hit the commit query. Yes, as of now, as you have said already, the insert has been made by data by by Hibernate, but it's not committed yet. But whenever I'll do step over, then only it will be uh, you know uh, hitting the database. Otherwise. Uh, it will not, it will basically roll back the changes. As of now, if I'll go to the database, I'll see that the commit has been made. Okay. 15 is there, Kavi Kavi by KK, because this commit has been done. Perfect. Now, now you're yes, coming back to the four type of uh, generation type that you have explained me previously. If I'm going to change it back to auto. Okay. Now, you, uh, now can you please explain me what this guy will do? And if I'll do the same thing, if I'll put a breakpoint here in the line number 27, let me let's say copy copy new and I'll say the actor KK new. Okay, do control S. I'll debug and put the debug, I mean breakpoint same in the same place only in the line number 27. Do you think right now the song will have the identifier or it will not have the identifier? Uh, basic, basically, the table is already created. So uh -huh. the, the moment you are going to execute this, it won't update our table. So by default, the ID will be available. But the moment you are going to fetch, it will be generate the sequence, a uh, sequence number that is already available in the database. So you may get the uh, primary key exception because okay. by default, it uh -huh. is using sequential mode. Even if we are defining as a auto, so uh -huh. it is internally calling the sequence way of generating ID. So if I hover over here, I'll, I'll see the ID assigned or I'll not see the ID assigned. Uh, no. Okay, perfect. Good job. Because it, whenever I'll do the set, it'll check the logic that you have explained, right? 
So it will basically right now automatically. Okay, hold on. I did a save. Okay. So I had an exception right now here, Yash. Why did I have that exception? As I said, the table was created by auto incremental, auto incremental mode. Okay. But by default, uh -huh. the hibernate auto mode for MySQL is sequential mode. Okay. So yes. that's why we are yes. getting that exception. Perfect. It is, it is saying my internet is not stable. So can you guys hear me or you are my voice? Yes, is but breaking. your voice is continuously breaking. Why are you not telling me? <laughs> we are your student from past one year. If we are not be able to understand what you want to say, how come you can call us or your student? Are <laughs> so yeah, so maybe I'm recording yes, with the Camtasia. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so I think it will not be any problem. Uh, I think your voice is clear. Cool. Okay, cool. So I'm going to do a resume. Okay. So, sorry, I'm going to hit resume. And well, you can see right now, uh, as you have told me, for the sequence, Hibernate is maintaining a table internally and it is trying to find the next value from my, um, you know, from that Hibernate sequence table. But well, we will not go with the sequence this time because I don't want Hibernate to manage my you know, uh, generation uh, type or generated value, rather I'll go with identity so that, you know, my, my SQL can do the job for me and my SQL will assign the key and it will be automatically mapped to this particular song ID. Why, when the save method will happen, it will automatically uh, update the song ID. The framework will update the song ID automatically, right? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So generated value, you have explained everything. I'm happy with that. Next question. Should I ask you a little bit tricky one yeah. right now? Yes, I'm not sure. Maybe, I, maybe I'll, I'll just keep this question for our tomorrow discussion. Anyhow, I don't want to pack anything to the people. We're going to have tech one right now. We're going to have another tech tomorrow because we are shooting it in our evening. And let me tell you that, you know, we have rescheduled this interview at least, you know, 20 times. If it is not yours, if it is somebody else, if it, if it is me in your place, I would have fired the interviewer. <laughs> like, okay, go away. I am not going to give your interview. <laughs> so yours has managed a lot. And I just want to thank you very much for that, yes. Uh, Really, really thank you very much for coming in because I'm sure that this is going to help others, All right? Thank you for sharing your knowledge. And uh, yes. So tomorrow I'm going to give you some little uh, tricky questions. Maybe I can ask you a few more questions right now. Uh, tell me about the named query. What do you mean by named query in Hibernate? Uh, why, do you need, why do you need named query and what is the importance of that? A named query is the concept to use at the rate named query annotation over the entity that we are declaring. That means if we want to provide or write a query that we do know that is required for that entity, some basic query like select record update record okay so if we pre we know that these queries are going to be required for that particular entity we can go with the name query concept and to implement that concept we can simply mark our entity with at the rate named query inside that we do need to define two property basically the one is like name the name is simply like the alias that we do need to provide for that entity and the other property is the query query is like the simple query a sql query that we want to provide okay and uh, if we have done that so whenever in our dao layer or in a method whenever we want to hit our database we can simply call the session dot create named query method and inside that we only need to provide uh, the name of uh, that entity that the, the alias name we have defined inside at the rate named query annotation and simply we need to pass other object the object we do need to perform operation on and then yeah hibernate will hit that query perfect what do you mean by criteria api in hibernate Criteria API. Mm -hmm. What is the use of criteria API? What is criteria? 
what do you mean by criteria in hibernate so okay <laughs> that one is tricky okay it's so, not tricky yes yeah means uh, no one asked me not yet tricky for you yeah, yeah maybe i do know what is but when it comes to a definition part i'm really not good with that okay, okay no problem so, tell me tell me i i really don't care about definition so, yeah rewards. you know that yes right yeah tell so me technically I, what yeah technically what technically criteria one is the way of defining which type of query we are defining like the native one or like the hql one the Perfect. like with the end class name with that what is the difference between hql and sql query and the native query in hibernate or in spring data or wherever it is yeah so when it comes to a hql concept in that way we are simply calling our entity name to hit or perform any operation inside database okay oh. when it comes to a sql we do need to define a table that is available in our database and uh, as 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 i told you hibernate is a object relation managing system so what does it really mean because we are defining our entity name that means the object name and hibernate is pretty much smart to understand if we are defining the entity name it is simply check if there is any entity available it will understand that yeah we are talking about that entity and it will use the hql concept to hit database okay and it put is native query so yeah you have to write the exact sql table, there yes table name that is present inside the uh, database basically so basically you are saying that the same query that we run in our you know SQ, in our database right let's say we yes, have sir. sql work uh, sql, uh, sql workbench or if you have a uh, sql developer or sql server workbench the same query that we write there to interact with our database we have to write the exact same query while we are using native sql in hibernate and um, we can use those criteria methods right yes. but if it is your you know the what do we call that sql then in, you have to mention there the entity name instead of the table name right and yes. you have to generate the sql query i mean the hibernate query language you have to use instead of the you know structured query language right yes sir perfect good job yash um okay so we are wrapping off the session right now and we'll be continuing from tomorrow morning and uh, not session i'm taking a mock right now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we'll be continuing from tomorrow morning uh well that's it well uh, for, for, for tomorrow morning i'm giving you a, another question on hibernate do some research and let me know if you if you know this answer just tell me right now have you heard about a exception called lazy initialization exception Don't yeah. say no. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have get that exception. When that exception occurs in Hibernate. Okay, cool. Cross check it, and just come back with some more answers tomorrow with this yes. exception, right? Yeah. Tell sure. me what are the different scenario when the lazy initialization exception. I think I'm pronouncing, or uh, I mean, just telling you the right exception name. lazy initialization exception or lazy instantiation lazy initialization exception i believe yeah i, I will okay. check that sir. you just check that and just let me know what are the different scenario this exception will offer okay sure cool so we will go with spring tomorrow and uh, yeah that's it let me stop the recording yes Think about a requirement. You have an entity called song, and you have a requirement that you have to fetch all your song objects from your database. If you want to do that, you will be going to your main application. So in this class, I have just written some base code so that I will have my session object using what I'll be writing my uh, you know query. So I'll write session dot create query, and I will be choosing one of the method. and maybe here i'll be writing my query let's say i want to fetch all the song uh, object from my database the song is my entity name right over here and on top of this i can just do a list right here and this is going to get me all the song list by piecing it from the database so here i'm writing a sql query or a hibernate query language i'm using to fetch my song object i can do a simple sys out and list over here to face all the all the songs 
and it's gonna print me all the songs that I have in my database. There we go. Okay, so now here I have used the SQL to paste all of my song object from my database. Right now what I want, let's say I have the same requirement in multiple places of in my project. Okay, in that case, I have to write the similar kind of code that I have written here in multiple places. And I have to create multiple SQL just like this. Instead of that, you can simply do a cut from here. I'll do a control X. I'll remove this piece of code. I'll go to my song.java, which is my entity. On top of my entity, I'll be using an annotation called named query. And choose the first one coming from Java extra persistence. I'll use the first parameter here as name. And this is gonna be the query name. And right now the query name is going to be anything. I can say my app dot all song because this uh, query that I'll be writing here. Can I can I give a comma and write query? This query that I'll be writing here is going to fetch all the song from my database, right? That's why I'm giving a valid name and I'll be using this particular name across my application whenever I want to execute this particular query. Right now, let's go to my application and let's run this query by using the name. I'll go over there and I will be using the session object again. And I'll be writing session dot, um, you know, get named query. And here I'll be giving the query name. Okay, in my case, the query name for for this is my app dot all song. Let me copy that, go to app three dot Java and simply paste it over here. And on top of this, you can just do a list and this is gonna get you the list of object, the list of song object that you'll be getting uh, through this particular query, okay? This is the name, but this particular name contains a query that you have defined right over here, which is your SQL query. Let's run this and let's try to print this particular list and see that uh, whether we are having our song list printed in our console over here or not. Control S do a run to this application. Let's observe the console. There we go. We got all our song object right over here. Now it served us for writing the duplicate query all over our application whenever we need to run this particular query instead of writing this one more time. I have written the same query on top of my entity by using the add named query annotation. So whenever I'll be using this frequently, I'll be just using the name instead of writing the entire query. Right now here I have a very small query, but this query can be really, really long. Okay, and maybe if you have any questions, okay, Vilas, I have three different queries which I use frequently in my application. So can I can I use couple of named query annotation right over here? Can I can I just do a copy and paste over here? Of course, you cannot do that. Okay, you cannot you cannot have multiple named query annotation over here. But one thing you can do, you can use the annotation called at the rate named queries. Okay, you can see at the rate named queries coming from Java Access Persistence. Go with that and this one will accept a value of, um, you know, named queries and this can be an array. So you can just copy your, all your named queries that you have in your project, paste it over here, give some comma to separate this and there you go, you are done. So here you can just give different name. For an example, for, for this named query, I can create a different named query like, you know, from song, I want to face all the songs where uh, the artist name is something. Let's say song S, where S dot artist name. Maybe I'll copy the artist, copy that, paste over here. This is the column name is equal to KK. Okay, so this is a, another particular query, and you can say my app did all song dot uh, KK. Right now, let's try to execute this particular query by using this particular you know, name, copy that, go to your app3.java and right over here, you can just do my app.all song instead of that, just paste your new query that you have written over here and run this and right now you'll see instead of all the songs of, uh, you know, um, you know, some different artists right over here, you'll be getting all the song of KK only. So can I run this? Let's observe the console. Well, we have a unknown column called KK. Can I go to song.java? 
oh sorry i have to write artist this kk will be in quote okay can i go to app3.java run this application there you go you got only the song which are done by kk right hopefully this is making sense and also instead of doing things like this you can also use some uh, persistence method like create named queries which are coming from your entity manager or also you have a session method uh, a method from the session called create named query you can also use this method instead of using get named query so in this case you will be just writing create named query give your named query name for an example go to your song.java copy one of the named query that you want to execute copy this go to your app3.java paste it and give the type that it will be returning in this case the entity object that it will be returning is song and of course right now it is basically a type set right now if i'll do command one over here and do assign statement to a new local variable i'll have a query over here created which is which is which is a type safe of song so basically i can take this create named query over here and i can just do as list or list to find out all the list of uh, in a song uh, you know with the criteria that i have defined over here in this named query can i go to my application do a run and the query will run as usual okay it is basically facing you all the songs because you are running my app that all song and that's the query that you have defined over here all right here is a simple requirement for you i have an entity over here called song and also i have established a, a relationship with my database table which is called songs which carries all my song data and here is the entity class for that i'm going to give you a requirement to you to get all the song object from my database of course there will be many solution but one of the famous solution is going to be writing a query a query can be a native query a native sql query or you can write query in jpql or in sql perfectly makes sense right now here is another way to query your song object I'll go to my app3.java and here I'll be start writing my code and I'm going to show you another way to query data from your database. You're going to use your session object for sure. And in your session interface, you have one API method called create criteria. So you can use criteria object to query data. And the difference it's going to make is that you can query data programmatically. The way you're going to do that you have to choose the method here called create criteria and you have to give the class name or entity name that you want to create the criteria for. For an example, I want to create a criteria for my song class or song entity. So I'm going to say song.class and there you go. Session.create criteria and I'm going to hit control one and assign the statement to a new local variable. And I'm going to say um, create criteria. Let's, let's go with the default name given by my ID. Well, so before I'm going to tell you anything, let me tell you that this create criteria method, I think is deprecated from, you know, Hibernate 5. I'm going to tell you another way to create criteria um, in a couple of minutes. But let me just convey uh, the message that I want to convey that, well, the criteria API is used for what? It is used to fetch data programmatically without even writing a query. The query will be returned by Hibernate dynamically. Here is an example. I have created a criteria over here. I can say create criteria dot list. Okay. And hit control one right over here. Assign the statement to a new local variable. Okay. And print out this list. And this is going to be the list of song, which is available in your database. If you're going to run this example, you're going to see in the console, all your song object are right now retrieved from the database from song number one. If you go all the way uh, to uh, the last, you can see song ID is 15 here. So all your song object are retrieved um, and the query has been fired. This query, uh, if, if you are seeing this query, this query has been fired by Hibernate dynamically. Not only simple query like this, you can also create complex dynamic query. For an example, let's say I want to give some, uh, you know, order clause for this um, entity. Okay. 
for an example, the criteria that I'm creating over here, I can add restriction to it. I can basically uh, do the pagination. I can do the filtering. I can do a whole variety of things. Here is an example. With this criteria object that I'm creating, I'm going to say create criteria dot order or add order and I can I can order something. For an example, let's order something. Let's see that all our song objects right now sorted and it's sorted by the ID and it's sorted by the ID ascendingly. First number one, then number two, followed by number three and this goes all the way till number 15. Okay, let's sort it descendingly. Let's sort all these things descendingly by song ID. And if you want to do that here, you can add something called order. Use this order over here. And this is going to help you sort properties in, in ascending order or in descending order. Let's say I want to sort something by the descending order. And what I want to sort with, I want to sort with the song ID. I can copy the column name and I can paste it over here. And I'm saying that right now with this criteria, I have added a order property. And here I'm saying I want to order in a descending way with the song ID over here. Let's see that whether it is working right now. I have just added one more condition to my criteria. Do control S, run this. And you can see right now, uh, the way you are getting your query is basically sorted descendingly based on your ID. 15, 14, 13, and it will go all the way. If you swipe to your right, uh, the last one is going to be the, the ID one. Okay, not only this, even you can make it even more complicated. You can basically add something called create criteria dot add. Let me add something over here. I will just add some restriction to this. And to, to do that, maybe I'll be creating a restriction over here. I'll say restriction dot. And you can see you have a lot of methods over here. You have variety of methods. Like, you know, if you want to restrict by what? Uh, let's say you want to use some and clause, you want to use some between, you have to add some uh, equal to, you have to add some greater than equal to, you have to add some greater than, you have to use some like clause, you know, if, if you want to use some in clause, you know, there are a lot of different ways. Let me use something called between and let me say, okay, the property name, let's say here I'm going to give my property name. My property name again is going to be song ID. Let's say I want to find all my songs between the number two uh, to number four. Okay. Between this ID, I want to find all my song. I'll do, I'll do hit control one. I'll assign the statement to a new local variable and um, maybe just give me a valid name over here. Make this seek smaller copy this and add it over here to my criteria query. And I'm just adding one more condition to this. Right now you'll see, I will not be getting all the, you know, song over here. I'll be getting songs between the number two to number four. And also I'm adding one more condition that all these things will be sorted in descending order. Let's see that whether that is happening or not Run this. So this time I will not be getting all the records and I'm getting number four, number three, number two, and I think one is not there. Okay, if you're gonna comment this out, this time you'll not be getting the data in descending order, you'll be saying number one will be first. Okay, so obviously number one is not there, so you're getting number two, number three, number four. Right, so you're getting the data in between this particular range. Just like between, you can add a number of different kind of clauses over here and the query that you are seeing over here, this will be this will be fired dynamically and will be built dynamically by your Hibernate. Okay, this is all about criteria. Not only this, I'm gonna tell you some more interesting thing. Let's say I'm gonna remove this particular thing and I don't want to use any order by or anything right over here. I'll do control S, I'll, I'll do run this. It is gonna get me all the queries. And also here, you can basically do pagination or you can do filtering, okay? For an example, if we'll go for a pagination example, maybe. I will just define some variable here. Let's say int, uh, let's say page size. Let's say I want to get only four records per page, right? You you have seen Google search, right? You have different numbers right there, zero, one, two, three, all are the page number. Maybe per page you get certain number of data, okay? So that thing you can define over here and you can set some properties to your criteria. For an example, right over here to your criteria, you can say criteria dot set first 
a result. Let's say my first result will be start from my zeroth index, and uh, I'll say create criteria dot set max result. Let's say the max result will be page size, and of course the page size is four. I'm defining. So what I'm what I'm saying over here, try to fetch the data from zeroth index. Obviously in my zeroth index right now, the song ID one object is there, and go till the page size. Okay, the page size is four. That means it's gonna pick the first four data from number one to uh, number four. Okay, do control S, do run this, and you will see you will get only four data over here, starting from number one and go all the way to it. It goes all the way to four. Change the change the page size is five. That means you'll get five number of record uh, for one shot. Okay, if you wanna run this, it's gonna start from number one and it goes all the way to uh, number five, right? And just like that, from the second phase, you'll be starting showing the data from the number fifth. Maybe I'll, you can just place over here number four uh, or number fifth right over here, do run this, and it will go till number six and it'll, it'll paste you another four records over here till number 10, okay? You can also make it dynamic. The way you can make it dynamic is basically by uh, defining another variable here. Let's say int page number. Okay, let's say your page number is two. And programmatically, I'll just give you a formula right now. Pretty, pretty easy and pretty simple formula. It's called page number minus one into page size. That's it. Let's say right now the page number is two and for each pages I want to show uh, five number of data. During this, you'll be seeing that um, for the page number two, we are showing data from number six till number 10, okay? For the page number three, it will be starting from number 11, you'll be seeing, run this, it will be starting from number 11, and it'll go till the number 15, okay? For each pages, you will be having the data, and just write this simple formula over here, and it's gonna work for everything, right? Do, do, do apply this logic and think about it, and this is gonna work for all this thing. And of course, this particular page number, you can fetch it from the end user uh, using your framework. Okay, so basically the Criteria API helps you to build dynamic query, it is helping you to do pagination, it is helping you to do filtering, and also uh, basically if you have a very complex query and you are doing a lot of string concatenation with those queries, instead of that, you can follow this approach to create the queries dynamically, and of course, string concatenation in SQL queries are bad because of course, if you're doing a lot of string concatenation, a hacker can basically inject some malicious data to your SQL query, which we call SQL injection. So one of the safety tips for SQL injection is do not use string concatenation while you are building your SQL query. But instead of going through that, we can also use Criteria API, and this is also one of the options. And of course, the session that create criteria is deprecated. Maybe in this way you can do something like this. So of course, if your project is using a higher Hibernate version, you can do things like this: session dot get criteria builder, and that's going to help you to get a criteria builder and assign the statement uh, to a new local variable. Now, from the criteria builder, you just can do create criteria and sorry, create a query. And you just need to provide the class, the entity class name, for an example, song.class. And there we go. This is gonna basically get you the criteria query. Once you get that, do whatever you want to do. Create query, dot order by. You can just do whatever you want to do, just the way we have done in our previous lesson. So this is basically the best way of creating a criteria query uh, in 2021. So basically I'm recording this video in the second half of the 2021 and the previous approach is deprecated. So this is the way you can create the criteria query and you can take the subject and then play with that. And I'll definitely recommend you to go to the wave and check out more about the criteria query, how we're building more and more advanced and complicated query using the Hibernate criteria query or the JPA criteria query, okay? Thank you.